here with you until 10. Now, today we're going to be talking about the speakership of the House of Commons over the next hour. Um, the current speaker, John Burko, has announced that he's departing and there'll be a new election for the speaker at the beginning of November. There are nine declared candidates so far. Well, we haven't got nine microphones in the studio, so we thought we'd do this in, in two batches, if you like. Um, so uh, joining me in the studio for the next hour to answer questions on this are Harriet Harman, the Labour MP for Camberwell and Peckham, former Deputy Leader and Chairwoman of the Labour Party and former Cabinet Minister, Sir Edward Lee, Conservative MP for Gainsborough, former Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, Shaila Shvara, Conservative MP for North West Cambridgeshire, former Northern Ireland Minister, and Sir Henry Bellingham, Conservative MP for North West Norfolk and former Foreign Office Minister. Lots of formers in those descriptions. Mm -hmm. We wonder who's going to be the future speaker. It could be one of the four people with me in the studio. We'll be doing a second round in on October the 24th with four of the five other candidates. So it'll be a bit of a problem if all five decide in the end that they want to do it, but there we go. Uh, but before we get underway, and they're all going to give... Um, about 90 second opening statements then we'll come to questions before we get underway i thought we would mark the 90th birthday of betty boothroyd the eyes to the right 372 the nose to the left 238 so the eyes have it the eyes have it order order before we get the main under question is that Miss Betty Boothroyd do take the chair of this House as Speaker. I wish to thank the House for the very great honour it has bestowed on me. Oh, oh, Dad, Mr. Campbell Savers, I'm sick and tired of hearing you shout out. From a... a great deal of pressure last Thursday upon the leader of the House to bring the Prime Minister to the dispatch box today and the leader of the opposition for this important debate. I want to hear that debate in silence. Prime Minister. Oh, oh, order, order, oh, order, 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 uh, order. I've just made it clear to Mr. Duncan Smith that the leader of the opposition is not giving way and yet since I made it clear he has been on his feet three times trying to intervene and to disrupt. Order! Oh, I haven't finished! I haven't finished! I have not finished as yet! The leader of the opposition has made it clear he's not giving way. It is the custom in this house, once that has been clearly stated, that honourable members do not go on pressurising. Order! 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 The honourable gentleman will resume his seat immediately. Immediately! Immediately! I shall name the honourable member. If he... Order! <laughs> There's an old sourpuss over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you elected me in the springtime, and I shall retire in the autumn. I think it is a very fitting seasonal conclusion to my period office. And therefore I say to all of you, in a phrase you know so well but has never been more true, time's up. <laughs> Well, that was Betty Boothroyd. I wonder um, how similar to Betty Boothroyd the new speaker will be. Well, if you have a question for our four contenders here, 0345 6060973 is the number to call. You can text your question to 84850. Right, 90 seconds from each of you on why you think you are the right person to be the next speaker of the House of Commons. Shaila Shvara, let's hear from you first. Uh, thanks very much, Ian. Uh, if I'm elected as speaker, I would seek to ensure that trust and confidence is restored to this very important role. I would be completely impartial, which sadly has not been the case in recent years. And it is very important that all colleagues are treated with respect and fairness. Parliament has recently been under a cloud regarding charges of bullying, harassment and sexual harassment. Dame Laura Cox in her report suggested some reforms, one of which was that there should be an independent process to deal with complaints and I would make it an absolute priority to get that process up and running. There must also be absolute zero tolerance for bullying and harassment of any kind whatsoever. I would have no favourites during debates and proceedings and experience and knowledge of subjects would take precedence over seniority and how long people have been in the chamber. I ro the role of MPs is constantly evolving and it's important that Parliament is constantly on the lookout to make sure that MPs and their staff 
are well served so that they can serve their constituents and the country even better. And finally, the Restoration and Renewal Programme is a massive undertaking which will take up billions and billions of pounds and it's very important that there is proper oversight of this massive project. There are other thoughts, but I'm sure they'll come out during the following hour. I'm sure they will, and I should um, explain, if you want to watch our proceedings over the next hour, you can do so on LBC's uh, website at lbc.co.uk, the YouTube channel, Facebook and uh, Twitter. Uh, so, Henry Bellingham, uh, tell us what, what your reasons for wanting to stand. First of all, John Burke has been, in many ways, the champion of the backbenchers. He's been a great reforming speaker, and he's someone who has push for boundaries in favour of, of the backbencher, holding the government to account. And that is incredibly important because we're elected on behalf of our constituents uh, and we have to basically, at times, hold the government to account. And he has enabled us to do that through, for example, more what are called urgent questions. So I would carry on that programme of uh, reform in favour of a backbencher. But I also think that we have a crisis in Parliament in many ways because uh, you have to have a speaker who is completely impartial. You've got to have someone who is rather like a, a, a great referee or a great umpire. You don't actually, they're never the story. Really good referees and umpires, uh, you never hear about them or their names, and they're never someone who grandstands or has a press conference. And the speaker has to, I think, be, he has to be impartial. He's also got to be, to some extent, or she, s s or she. Uh, they've got to be someone who commands total respect across the entire house. And I think the point that Charlotte made regarding the, the bullying culture, that the, the investigation into bullying in the House of Commons, it did point the finger at the very top, and it pointed to a culture, not just uh, uh, among the higher echelons of the, uh, of the speakership, but also many other very senior people in Parliament obviously have not been treating their staff with respect. And I think that respect and courtesy to everyone. And my mantra will be, I, I'm a senior parliamentarian. I first elected in 83. In fact, obviously, uh, I, I haven't had as many years in the House as, for example, Harriet Harman or Edward, because I had four years out, as you well remember, Ian. But I think that having someone who has been around a long time and who is known to be someone of, of, of integrity, who is going to treat everyone with respect, that'll send a really strong signal across the entire parliamentary okay. estate. Henry, thank you. Harriet Harman? Well, like all of us, I've been an MP for many years and I'm frankly very worried about Parliament. Um, I think the public think we're terrible at the moment. I think that they don't like to hear us shouting and jeering at each other. You know, outside in the workplace, people think much more carefully about how they relate to each other and how they work well together. And we seem to be going in the opposite directions. Relations in the House are more fractious and bitter than I've seen them mm. for for decades, basically. And relations between Parliament and government are strained to breaking point. And I think this really matters because Parliament matters. You know, it's people's individual votes. It's their MP. We need Parliament to work and have respect and to have self-respect because otherwise it leaves a vacuum where it's just mob rule or the far right. And so I think there's a real problem with loss of respect and confidence. And I think the new speaker is actually an opportunity to press the reset button on all those problems, the relationship between Parliament and the public, the relationship between MPs amongst ourselves and the relationship between MPs and government. And I think the new speaker, as everybody's said, needs to be fair, needs to be authoritative, I think it's good to understand that government has got a job to do, which they do have, but also they mustn't trample over Parliament. We've got to respect government, but government's got to respect Parliament. And I think the person in the chair needs resilience. I think it's one heck of a job right now, and you need to be resilient. And I've been under fire during many decades, and certainly I've got a hind of a... A rhino. Did I say a hide? A not hide. a hide. A hide. A hide of yeah. a rhino. Let, um, let's not dwell on that. But I think that I think that basically um, the speaker's got to be prepared to reform the office of speaker and to listen to how it should change because there's no checks and balances. It's unaccountable power, and that's not the way things should be at the moment. And I'm a reformer, and I always recognise the need to change things. And finally, we've had 157 speakers over the last 600-odd years. 
and only one has been a woman, Betty Boothroyd. But actually, Parliament isn't the old boys' club that it used to be. There are now more than 200 women. There are women MPs on all sides of the House. And with a man as Prime Minister, a man as Leader of the Opposition, as man as Leader of the SNP, okay. I think a woman in the chair would show women outside that actually women have got a part to play as well. OK, Harriet, Edward Lee. Well, I, I agree with that, but of course... <laughs> May the best man or woman win. I mean, it's ir irrelevant whether you're a man or woman. It's the best person. I, but I have to agree with everything which has been said so far. I mean, of course we have to be totally impartial. Of course we've got to end bullying. I was very taken with the clip you had of Betty Boothroyd. I mean, I sat through her speakership and nobody ever criticised. Although she was a Labour MP, she, you know, you couldn't tell that. She was a great character, completely fair. So... I want to be, I would like to be Speaker because I, I love the House of Commons and I want to serve it and I want Parliament to serve the people. And following on from what Shailish said, uh, because this is a new point which hasn't perhaps been covered so far, I do think, and I'm speaking as a former chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, that just as the expense scandal rocked Parliament, I think we're going to be rocked by this decant of Parliament, which we could take to up to 10 years, spending billions of pounds of taxpayers' money and building a permanent replica chamber, which I have to say to you, Ian, I think is a complete waste of money, better spent on the people rather than on ourselves. And I would be campaigning on that basis that if we do have to decant, it should be for as short a time as possible into a temporary chamber, much cheaper. So that's a particular point that I should be making, and I think my friend Charlie should be making it as well. And so will I, actually, as well. And so will Henry. Oh, we're <laughs> unanimous then. <laughs> <laughs> and Harriet and they said there wouldn't be any controversy in this hour uh, right we will come to your calls um, I've got a few questions I'd mm. like to ask myself as well 0345 6060 973 84850 on the text you've heard all four candidates set out their stall uh, what are your questions for Shailish Varas, Sir Henry Bellingham, Sir Edward Lee and Harriet Harmon you're listening to LBC, it's quarter past eight LBC. I'm James O'Brien. Do join me for an exclusive recording of my Full Disclosure podcast for Global's Make Some Noise. Full Disclosure is a podcast where I sit down and have in-depth conversations with major names from the worlds of politics, entertainment or culture, people who don't always give lengthy interviews. This special recording will take place on Monday the 17th of February at the Leicester Square Theatre in London. To buy tickets with all proceeds going to Global's Make Some Noise, just head over to lbc.com. Co.uk. Get ready for Brexit.
for the speakership. Simon is in Orpington. Simon, what's your question? Yeah, hi there. My question for the candidates is, if they were in the chair, would they have granted Standing Order 24 for the no-deal Brexit debate in the way that John Burko did? Right. Um, let's go to Henry Bellingham first. No, is the answer to that, because I think that although we want the Speaker... Uh, Henry, I'm going to say to, you need to, to put your headphones down because you, <laughs> you will look ridiculous on camera, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't want that. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> I, I'm glad you didn't say I look ridiculous anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Standing on 24 is basically... You, you try and persuade <clears throat> the Speaker to give you a debate on, on something where there's an immediate, urgent need. And I think using it to, to promote a, uh, a backbench bill is the wrong way uh, of using SA24. I've got a, a, a backbench bill at the moment, which I'm trying desperately hard to get through, Parliament, and I haven't been given that extra time to get my bill through. And I think the problem with the Ben bill, I didn't have a difficulty with the, the Ben bill uh, trying its luck in Parliament, but it has not had proper scrutiny. It went through in a day. Complicated uh, clauses in that bill, no proper scrutiny. That was enabled by the SA24, and I certainly would not have allowed it. Um, Edward Lee. I, I agree with that. There has to be a balance between government and parliament. Um, government is running the country and parliament holds it to account. And traditionally, for that reason, only government has been able to bring in bills. So what Mr Burko did was something very unusual and novel. And I, we don't need to get into the whole debate about whether you're Brexit or Remain. It doesn't matter. He has set a very unfortunate precedent. And if the opposition are crowing now, they've got to realise that soon they could well be the government <coughs> and the boot could be on the other foot. So there has to be a balance. So the simple answer to that question uh, is no I don't agree with what Mr Burko did. I don't agree with overturning precedent. I mean, maybe in time we could change it. I'm on the procedure committee. Maybe we could have a lengthy report. We could have a debate in Parliament. We could have a free vote. And perhaps we could move to a new, uh, a new way of doing things. But in the middle of a controversy, to throw all the rules into the air, to allow one faction in Parliament to bill in, bring in a bill, to only have one day's debate mm -hmm. is not fair or right. Harriet Harman. Well, I think the controversy arose because the Speaker felt that he was doing the right thing on behalf of Parliament, allowing Parliament to debate what it chose and allowing it to vote the way it wanted. And there was a majority at the end of that debate uh, for the motion that was put forward. But the argument was that this was unprecedented and this was outside of the rules and the difficulty is that the speaker is one of the last unreformed centers of power where it just rests <coughs> in one person and there say so and there are no checks and balances so i for example to to avoid that sort of real ill feeling that remains as a result of that I would be interested in looking at some sort of situation whereby if the Speaker was going to go against the advice of the Clerk of the House as to what was permissible, that they should have to, say, get the support of the majority of their deputies or some other check to make sure that the Speaker was properly accountable to Parliament. I do think that the Speaker has to let Parliament um, really hold the government to account, but the way to do it um, is to have proper processes and checks and balances, not just have power residing in one person, which then all hell breaks loose. I'm not if quite they sure you've answered it. the question there. I mean, if you'd been in John Burko's situation on that particular day, would you have granted that Standing Order 24? Well, if I'd have become Speaker when John Burko becomes, became Speaker, I would have reformed the powers of the Speaker to <laughs> no, make sure. Yeah, Harry, come on. No, 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 because I, I actually think that I don't want to rest my case for being speaker on criticizing and challenging the 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 decisions of my predecessor i think surely that's people have not got a right to know if you agree with the decision of John but Barclay. they can see how i would suggest that i would work which is i would ensure that there were checks and balances and more accountability in the system but i think ultimately the speaker is elected by and accountable to parliament government have got their job to do as i said but their job is not to prevent parliament having a debate on what they want to debate and voting on what they want to do but to avoid the ill feeling and the accusation accusations of prejudice which can't then be rebutted you've got to have proper okay. systems in place Shilas? 
Uh, no ambiguity from me. I would not have granted uh, that vote, and I would, uh, if I became Speaker, make it a point that the rule book is looked at again, because we cannot have a situation where the Speaker makes policy on the hoof. Uh, on the one hand, uh, when it suits the Speaker, he has said that uh, uh, precedent has to be followed, and when it didn't suit him, then he said that, well, Parliament is to be evolving and precedents will be But if you take that view, nothing would ever change. The no. Speakership would never evolve, would it? No. What I propose to do is to ensure that the rule book is looked at to make sure that everyone knows what the rules are on both the government side and the opposition side. And Harriet makes the point that uh, it was perceived, you know, that the, she said, felt that the Speaker was acting in good faith. I think you used the word that it, it was acting uh, impartially. The reality is that there are a lot of people who took the view that he was not being impartial. And M what we have to do... Um, absolutely. Uh, and and, and uh, I'm not going to shy away f from saying that. But I think it's important to make it clear to everybody what the rules are so that the speaker isn't put in the compromising position of having to decide because no matter how well intentioned she or he is the fact is that decision will upset some people and those people may well say that's a biased decision that's not impartial and therefore you shouldn't put the speaker in that position and should have clear rules um ron says uh, please don't let harriet off answering the standing order 24 question ian well, i'm going to make one final attempt let's assume that this happened you are elected speaker and this happens within the first fortnight of your speakership you have to make the decision on the rules that are there now in a similar situation would you make that decision well this is a entirely hypothetical it is indeed but i would make sure that i drew on and tried to build a consensus around the decision uh, especially if the clerk was advising um that it was not within precedent to do it but actually you know i'm sure all your listeners to the extent that they're listening to this are tearing their hair out thinking why is she not answering the question but my point is this is it's very easy to run for some position on the basis of slagging on the slagging off the person that's been in it previously i will be it's a very it's different not slagging off it's well, constructive no, criticism uh, isn't it? well except that where does constructive criticism lead you i agree with shilesh that basically the system needs review the house needs to look at the powers of speak the speaker and i think the speaker should okay. invite the house to look at the speaker's power and say how can these be modernized how can the speaker be made more accountable how can it be more transparent so that people don't just get taken by surprise by something that the speaker has decided in his apartments um and i think that's the way to go there's right. always going to be controversial decisions but the point is to make sure that you've got support for them rather than just being left exposed to right. accusations Qu of bias quick response from you simon um, well, I think three out of the four answers were clear there. Um, I think the new Speaker does have quite a job in restoring trust in the function of the Speaker, uh, certainly in the eyes of the public, and so I wish the three the very best of luck. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky Simon hasn't got a vote. <laughs> You're not an MP, are you, Simon? I don't think he, I don't Hall, think he is. Yeah. Um, he'll, listen, he'll probably be lobbying his MP, right, though. I, I want um, quick answers. We've got um, three minutes before we go to the news, so quick answers on this. I want you all to give me the best thing that you think John Burko has done, and also the worst. That's not slagging off, that's just constructive criticism, I think. Um, Harriet, start with you. I think that he has, um, as Shailish said, he's wanted to stand up for backbenchers to enable them to do the very best they possibly can. I think my style in the chamber would be more low-key, less flamboyant, um, and I would be wanting the MPs to be in the spotlight rather than myself. And, what, and what's a bad thing that you think he's done? What's he got well, that's wrong? Well, you've got to infer that from my second part of my <laughs> okay. answer. So I'm very bad is at Is that inferring. I think I would be a more, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a more low-key person okay. in the chair, allowing the excitement to be on the floor of the House, not in the chair. Edward? The best thing he's done, and he's a personal friend of mine, so I've got no intention of slagging him off although I, he does infuriate me quite a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, the best thing he's done is to be not pompous and to let many more backbenchers in. That's very good, uh, and nobody can criticise him for that. The worst thing he's done 
is to give an impression that the speakership is no longer impartial and that goes back to the previous question from simon about standing older 24 and that is very much the worst thing he's done because you know this is the mother of parliaments we have given parliamentary democracy to the England, world england is the mother of parliaments oh england is yes. the mother of parliaments that's, well, that's Ian, the actual always... quote all right <laughs> well i stand corrected well, I know but some, you know what the point i know I'm somebody on twitter is going to correct you so i might as well do it do it first <laughs> um shilesh um i think right. in terms of the good points um he certainly helped to modernize uh parliament in terms of introducing the creche uh for workers there who have young children he's also is, introduced... it, is it widely used the crash yes it, it, is, it is actually yes um he's also introduced a a work placement scheme to allow people who wouldn't normally have an opportunity to come to Parliament to have that experience. Um, and also he's um, uh, introduced the, the Education Centre, which is fantastic in allowing youngsters from across the country to come there. In terms of the worst thing, um, uh, this is not to slag anyone or certainly not slag Speaker Burko. But it is simply uh, a statement of fact. Uh, he has been biased. He has uh, not been impartial. And uh, that has been apparent. And we have to look at the person at the, uh, who sits in that chair to say that one of the reasons why Parliament is in the state that's in at the moment is because the person who's supposed to be impartial and the empire and not a player has actually taken, okay. it seems, uh, sides with one of, one of the players. Yes, I think equal first. I think the Education Centre is uh, a really fantastic uh, uh, initiative. And also empowering the backbencher much more, by giving the backbencher more opportunities. I think the worst things he's done, I think the, the Speaker should never, ever be rude to colleagues, be firm like Betty Boothroyd and like Jack Weverall, but actually make gratuitously rude comments to MPs of all parties, completely unacceptable. And the Speaker should never, ever let the public know his views on key issues of the day. And he certainly should never have a, a press conference uh, uh, on College Green. Well, some clear answers there. We'll have more of your questions in a moment. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. Somebody wanted to know whether if I was Speaker, I would wear the wig. I might ask that question to our panel in just a short while. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's half past eight. Dominic Ellis has the news headlines. In the last half hour, Boris Johnson about his link to an American businesswoman. The Prime Minister denies breaking any rules of conduct over his relationship with Jennifer Akuri when he was Mayor of London. The Foreign Secretary has urged America to reconsider granting immunity to a diplomat's wife who is accused of causing a car crash which killed a teenager in Northamptonshire in August. Dominic Robbs met America's ambassador to discuss Anne Sakoulis, who fled to the US. And Boris Johnson has held talks with the Irish Premier Leo Varadkar as negotiations to avert a no-deal Brexit it hang in the balance. The two leaders spoke by telephone this evening.
Britain's Conversation. Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. Coming up to 25 to 9 here on LBC. If you'd like to watch us, you can do so on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk, the YouTube channel, Facebook page or Twitter. Harriet Harman is here, Sir Edward Lee, Shyla Shvara, Sir Henry Bellingham, all candidates for the Speakership of the House of Commons. Um, right, some more questions from me before we come back to calls. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. Um, Shailish, you, you kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier on in the fact that John Burko has opened up Parliament to the public more than any other speaker. Would you commit to continuing with this, including allowing the youth parliament to continue sitting in the chamber? Um, Harriet. Well, I think it's a very good thing that the youth parliament once a year sits in the House of Commons chamber. But I do think that it's it's not right that... The rest of the time when the House is not sitting, the chamber is empty and not allowed to be used. And the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly, they actually, on Fridays if they're not sitting or at weekends, they allow other people to debate in their chambers and to be involved in that activity. And I think that rather than just leaving those green benches empty, we should allow others to come in and debate in our chamber. And I organised, um, with a number of others, uh, a conference for uh, 100 women MPs from 100 different countries all around the world. But I had to get special permission from the House of Commons. We all had to vote and agree that that should happen. I think as a matter of course that people should be able to come in and sit in the chamber. It gives people a sense of familiarity and understanding and I just think it's precious and not right to say that if we're not sitting there, nobody else can. You could actually make, turn it into a revenue earning opportunity, couldn't you? Hire, hire it out for big companies well, to... I, I would see it more as MPs bringing people from their constituency. Schools run debating activities, you know, communities community groups. I think let them use their parliament. We're members, but if we're not actually sitting, let them come in and use those green benches. Henry Bellingham, you let out a big sigh there. Yes, it, it is precious. It's an extraordinary place, and we've got to try and rebuild its authority. And we don't do it by letting out the chamber to the Women's Institute, maybe to the British Legion, whoever they might be, however worthy they might be. And certainly, I, I would not in fact, like to continue with the youth parliament using the main chamber. I would, I think they could use Westminster Hall. And actually, but why not? What harm has it done? I think what it does, we're, we're talking about an institution that dates back hundreds of years, whose authority has been undermined. And I think we've got to try and restore that authority. And also, uh, a certain amount of uh, mystique about it as well. This is a, an, a, an incredible place where we, we are elected on behalf of our constituents to represent their interests. And to be elected is an incredibly challenging, difficult thing to achieve. And, and I think the only people who should be there debating the, the great, issues, great issues of the day are MPs. That's a personal view. It may not be universally popular, but in this campaign I plan to speak my mind. But you will, you know by saying that, you will be seen as a complete fuddy-duddy. <coughs> I don't think necessary at all. I think that, that there is a, a, a real uh, place in this contest for people who want to restore some of the traditions of Parliament. And we need to... I mean, I, my, my, uh, my, my mantra is going to be uh, modern approach, traditional values. And to me, part of those values is, is the Chamber and preserving everything that's incredibly special about it. How is it a modern approach to refuse to let the youth parliament to sit in it? I mean, bearing in mind yes. that we all want, well, presumably, mm. we're all in favour of younger people getting involved yes, in Yes, yes, I politics. quite agree. We've got the education centre that costs millions of pounds. We've got Westminster Hall, where he could go and debate. We're going to decant from parliament, and there's going to be a, maybe a, an alternate chamber. I'd like to have a temporary uh, chamber uh, in the building we decant to, and that could be used, indeed, by the youth parliament. I wouldn't okay. mind that. Charles? Um I would certainly keep the Youth Parliament there. In fact, uh, if memory serves me right, I was Shadow Deputy Leader of the Commons and Harriet was Leader of the Commons and we had some input in ensuring that uh, they could actually use the facilities that they do now. It is also a question of... the third time you've agreed with Harriet today. I'm not sure which one of you is more, should be more worried about that. I, I, I think... Or is this a unifying approach? <laughs> Well, to, to an extent, certainly whoever's the speaker is certainly going to have to work cross-party. But the other thing I would say is that it has to be horses for, or, or courses for horses. And uh, sometimes what I do when I've got school visits is that I will take them to a committee room and then split them out on, onto 
either side of the room as if it were a uh, a pretend uh, parliamentary chamber and when you've got a small number of, of children from a particular school that is more appropriate. Can I just say one other thing and Harriet earlier on mentioned that it would be nice to have uh, a second woman uh, speaker uh, and uh, that we haven't had that many in the past. Can I just say that actually uh, of the 157 speakers that we've had in the past uh, there's never been a non-white uh, speaker mm. uh, and perhaps uh, if I were to be elected and, and I say that on the basis that I, I, I recognise that all the candidates are good and able to do the job but if there were to be a distinguishing feature uh, then I think that if I were selected as uh, or elected as speaker it would certainly be breaking um, or indeed shattering the odd glass ceiling. Okay. I, I agree with that and I think you know, we we're a very different. That. We're a very different country than we used to be, and a very different parliament. When I was first elected, there was not one single non-white parliament, non-white oh, member okay. of that parliament, and yet the country outside was very diverse. And one of the good things that's happened is that there are now more black and Asian members of parliament, but mm. people won't get to see that unless somebody's in the chair. So I think that the symbolism and the representation that the chair Im embodies I think is important as well so sorry to Henry and Edward but <laughs> <laughs> Edward well we're, we're, we're all part of minorities there haven't been <laughs> what, what's yours um, well there's only been Knight, one Knight of the Realm <laughs> no no no, no. <laughs> there, there's only been one woman speaker there's only been one Catholic in 500 years oh, is know. that right yeah I think there's only but been one Jewish person you can't tell your Catholic by looking at <laughs> so I don't mean anyway let's not uh, I think, uh, actually, fun enough, I wrote, uh, when I was a young man, uh, I wrote to Norman St. John Stevens, who was then leader of the House, and said, could we have a debating, could we debate in the in the House of Commons? Well, I didn't even dare suggest that near it, because I was completely brushed away. So, I mean, for the reasons that Henry said... Um, and he was a moderniser. Uh, he was supposed to be a moderniser. <laughs> yeah. So, for the reasons that Henry said, when this whole idea of the Youth Parliament started, I was a bit sceptical, I have to admit, because I thought that you know this is such a great thing being elected to the house of commons he's elected by people and we shouldn't allow the people but to be honest the youth parliament has grown on me i think it does absolutely no harm there's never i i don't think there's been any incident i think they're actually better behaved than we are uh, and so i i I, no I, I i see no harm but where i think harriet is wrong uh, and where i'm more with shylish is that you know although you've got many worthy organizations i think just to sort of hire it out like that mm. would just start demeaning the whole thing i'm not sure this happens in any other parliament i don't think if we were talking about the u.s house of representatives or the national assembly in france uh, or the bundestag that they would think in these terms so by all means the youth parliament yes but let's you know proceed slowly and by the way one last point this is quite interesting one of the reasons why the building is falling down and we're now talking about a massive decant hole work is that we're sweating the building too much we're using it all the time it's being all used all through the summer recess and really we should clear out i know i'm making a new point but you'll forgive me and we should clear out because i'm a politician after all <laughs> we, we should we should just clear the building out for the whole of august the whole of september work mm. double shifts try and do as much work as possible because i'm still determined in this little show to try and make the point that we are in danger of parliament really falling to disrepute mm. if we spend billions perhaps four or five billion pounds on ourselves over the next 10 years so i mean i don't want to sweat parliament too much you know and i, I want want to have a period where we can repair it and renew it um your slogan what was it again yes <laughs> modern approach traditional values <laughs> do, do the traditional values stretch to wearing the wig as george thomas and bernard weatherill used to yes 100 percent. and the point about the, the speaker being in a wig and the clerks wearing wigs is it's not about them as an individual <coughs> It's about the office, it's about the institution. Or, or if you take the clerks, for example, all of the great knowledge of procedure, of the history of, of, of bills in Parliament, the parliamentary acts, that is in, it actually embodied in those clerks. And they wear a wig and they look like QCs. They're now wigless and they just look like you know, scruffy East European judges. And, <laughs> and, and nothing against East European judges. But the speaker... How many have you actually come across? Uh, I, I've been to many East European countries. I was a barrister once. Uh, it's Ian. a very strange thing to say, if you don't mind me saying Well, so. well shall we say scruffy lawyers in uniform? <laughs> but the, spe the speaker himself, it's about 
it's not about the individual. You've just it's offended about, my producer because she's it, from Poland. It's about the office. I'm so sorry. I've <laughs> lost some votes I've as well. But the, but the speaker should be like a good referee and a good umpire. They dress in a certain uniform because it's not about them as a, an individual. It's about the okay. office. Um, Wig, Shailash? Um Personally, no. Uh, but I do believe there ought to be a balance uh, in terms of modernity, uh, but also respecting uh, some traditions. So certainly there ought to be something uh, to distinguish the speaker, uh, whether it's a gown or something else, uh, I don't know. But I, I think uh, we have to change with the times and we're in the 21st century. But I think one of the uh, advantages of having some attire, which is different, is that as in a courtroom, as Henry has alluded, in a courtroom, it does give gravitas to the position and make sure that everyone does appreciate that the speaker is there to control proceedings. Harriet, are you in need of gravitas? <laughs> are you in need of a wig? Are you going to wear a wig, Harriet? I think if you have to depend for your authority in the chair as speaker on wearing a wig, I think you've lost it already. And I think th the speaker is there elevated in the chair. Um, Betty Boothroyd didn't wear a wig and she had plenty of authority. Mm. Um, I'm just struggling with um, Henry's, uh, <laughs> his, his, his little motto to work out where the modern bit is actually. Because <laughs> so far we've got shutting out the public, we've got wearing wigs, we've got, you know, um, I, it's very good actually that, that people have got a good choice here, a good range of candidates. We can now see the breadth of that range. But I do have to say that even if Henry t were to win with his very traditional values, I would support him in the chair because I think it's actually the responsibility of all members to support the chair. Absolutely. It's a bit like ice skating. It's harder than it looks, I think. And, you know, it matters to all of us that we support the chair and that uh, we do what we can to... to Edward, I, I can see you in the wig, I have to say. Well, you're very kind, Ian. I'm not sure that's a compliment. <laughs> no, it is. It absolutely is. Um, I'm, a, I'm a barrister, so it doesn't worry me wearing a wig. I used to wear it quite a lot when I was in the courts. And just to defend Henry for a moment, because everybody's <laughs> attacking him in a very cruel and nasty way. <laughs> not everyone. I, I haven't... <laughs> uh, the reason why, actually, judges and barristers wear wigs is they're doing a very difficult job, and they're deliberately hiding their personality you know if you're sentencing someone to prison for a long time so th there is a reason actually behind wearing a wig it's not just a sort of old fogey ridiculous thing but uh, you know i think there may be a, a point in some very formal attire even a wig on a f great state occasion the opening of parliament uh, this is a you know aesthetic beautiful occasion so i'm certainly prepared to consider that but to be pigeonholed as the guy who wants to stand for speaker because he wants to wear a wig i don't want to be in that place i will just mention lord fowler nobody's mentioned him now he's the lord speaker all right he's he he, he compares the house of lords and nobody criticizes him in his dress in his demeanor in how he's fair and this is goes back to the point that Shilish is making. He is different, you know, in his dress and his in his demeanour, but he's still part of the twenty first century. So I think there is actually a, a way forward in this. Perhaps you know maybe the wig on great state occasions, but I assure you that wearing a wig is deeply hot and deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> I'll take your word for that, I have to say. <laughs> uh, right, we'll have more questions. If you'd like to give us a call, oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. It's eight forty seven. James O'Brien.
is LBC with Ian Dale. Call 0345 6060 973. 851. Um, let me put a question to our four speaker contenders here about Prime Minister's questions. How would you reform Prime Minister's questions? Would you... Um, John Burko lets it go on for 45 minutes, even sometimes up to an hour. Would you cut it back to the normal 30 minutes? Do you think it should go back to twice a week, 15 minutes each, as it was in John Major's and Margaret Thatcher's day? Or are there any other reforms that you would like to make? Um, Edward? In a very good question, no. John has made a big mistake in allowing Prime Minister's questions and other statements and urgent questions to go on and on and on so that everybody gets in. If everybody gets in, people know they're going to get in and therefore more and more people pile in. Now, it's no accident that the best speeches ever made in Parliament historically are speeches. So we've got to have a balance, I'm afraid, and we've got to cut down the length of these statements and urgent questions and Prime Minister's questions. We've got to allow more time for proper debates. You cannot give a great speech if you're limited to two or three minutes because these statements and urgent questions have just taken up most of the day so he has allowed these things to run on too long mm. henry i would agree with edward 100 percent. i think that as far as prime minister's question is concerned i'd keep it uh, once a week on a, on a wednesday for half an hour but i would make sure if possible that the that the main participants were, were, were quicker i would keep you know, trying to hurry them along. Uh, I, I might actually uh, uh, be quite strict because sometimes uh, you know, the Prime Minister gives very long answers and vice versa, the, the leader of the opposition asks long questions. But I think the people on the order paper should be called. But to basically let it go on way into you know, near, near to one o'clock is a mistake. And I agree with Edward. I think that these statements, when, when we first came into the House, uh, Edward and myself and Harriet, uh, statements never lasted more than an hour. And, and, and the people who wouldn't necessarily get called but if they weren't called that time they'd be called you know the next time yeah. but we we've had dozens of statements on brexit and most have gone on for maybe you know an hour and a half two hours even three hours i mean how the speaker manages to stay in the chair without a comfort break i just don't know <laughs> i'm not sure any of us wish to know um, Shires. i would keep it to just a wednesday i would uh, agree with edward that uh, this speaker has allowed statements urgent questions to go on and on and on and I think we need to recognise that whilst we need to make sure that backbenchers can hold the executive to account uh, the executive does need to get on and do some work because it has a mandate at the general a mandate at the general election to deliver on its policies and I think it's also important to remember that during the debates what we often find is that those very backbenchers that we are told are getting to challenge the executive those very backbenchers are finding that they either don't get called in debates or that they only have two or three minutes to speak at the end because there have been, I mean, yesterday I believe there were five uh, urgent questions. And uh, that time isn't is that just, a, that, that that time just curtailed. No, no it, it is a good thing up to a point. But when you find that the 80th Member of Parliament is standing up and saying what the 63rd one, had, <laughs> asking the 63rd one had said, as had the 57th one, as had twenty, you know, it gets rather repetitive after a while, and, and I think what we need but, to but remember... they shouldn't bother standing up. If their question has already been asked, why do they bother standing up? But if the speaker is going to allow them, if the speaker is going to allow them, then they will. But I think the important thing is that by having these urgent questions and statements going on and on, you actually curtail the debates that follow, which are important legislation, which impact on millions and millions of people. And it's right that when we have those debates, people who have knowledge of those subjects get to speak rather than not getting an opportunity, because then we are doing a disservice to legislation, which is so fundamental to what Parliament now, does. Now, Harriet, you're unique in that you've actually taken part in Prime Minister's questions when you were acting uh, leader of the Labour Party. Um, how would you like to see the system changed? Well, I've done it from both sides. I've done it from the government mm -hmm. side and the opposition side, and I've been a backbencher on both sides as well. And I think the problem is that because the leader of the opposition has six questions backbenchers don't even get a look in and, and then you've got the SN the leader of the SNP backbenchers he don't start bit, he? don't start getting a look in until about 20 past and mm. interestingly quite a, a lot of people have said to me that it's a pity that the backbenchers don't get a follow up question because they ask a question that they're very knowledgeable about and very concerned about the prime minister does a brush aside non answer and they don't get a comeback on it. And I think there is 
it's ripe for review, Prime Minister's questions, but I don't think it should be done by Speaker's diktat, by the Speaker just deciding, oh, I'm going to make it back to half an hour or I'm going to keep it at 45 or 50 minutes. I think there needs to be proper consideration about it. But, I mean, having done the Leader of the Opposition gig and actually having to ask six, six questions, sometimes it seemed to me like even a really long time and I was like wishing it was only four or even possibly two because you are excluding a lot of people and you're just filling up a lot of, of, of time with six questions. Sometimes you want to ask six questions and sometimes you don't. So I think there's got to be a rebalancing towards the back benches and away from the front benches. Mm -hmm. And the Prime Minister's got to answer the flipping question. How often does the Prime Minister actually ask, answer the question rather than just make a score point um, that then the backbench can't come back on. Okay. I think it'd be much more demanding. I certainly would have been much more fearful doing Prime Minister's questions from the government side if I knew that my fob off, too clever by half answer, which raised a laugh, could actually get a comeback. Mm. Um Obviously, given that John Burko has become quite a controversial character, um, I guess one of the main priorities of whoever becomes Speaker will be to try and unify the House in a way that maybe it, it isn't united at the moment. Now, this is kind of a question more for you two, I think, in that you're, you're, you both have histories of, shall we say, more tribal politicians than I think Shailash and Henry. Maybe that's a judgment on my part. Um, but you've, in order to win, you've got to get support from across the House. How are you both going to do that? How are you first? Well, I think that the House is looking to, well, it's not yet, but it's probably going to have a really deep think about the qualities of the person they want to be in the Speaker. Everybody's recognising that the House is in problems. I mean, every time we go to work there, we know it's in problems. Every time we speak to our constituents, everybody's criticising the House. So I think there's going to be Instead of people thinking, oh, we just need somebody amiable in the chair who's going to be nice to people and who's who's going to be fair, all of those are necessary anyway, they might be thinking quite differently about whether or not they need somebody in the chair who's going to have the ability to reform it and change it with the times. Because unlike Henry, I think in a way, the way you build confidence is by moving with the times, not turning the clock back. Can Can I, Henry said he's modern. Mm. Can I just come in on that? <laughs> Very quickly. I, and then I, 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 I think the other thing that we need uh, in the new speaker is leadership. Uh, and, and that, I think, is, is perhaps something that, that is in short supply at the moment, because it's not only just looking after what happens in the chamber, uh, but the speaker is chairman of the House of Commons Commission. And the House of Commons Commission drives reforms and changes. And one of the things we referred to the Dame Laura Cox report earlier on, that was a year ago. And the recommendations she made, three recommendations, she said that they should be treated as a priority and urgent. And one of the, one of the most important ones is still outstanding. Okay. So we need leadership. Yeah. Edward? There's no problem with your um, question. Uh, when Harriet left the government, uh, when Tony Blair asked her to do something else, you, Harriet, you asked me to join you in a commission. We worked together. Harriet and me can work together. It's the old adage that you know, your enemies are sitting around you in the House of Commons. There's only your political opponents opposite you. So there's no difficulty in any of us building bridges. Uh, and I don't actually accept that Harriet or myself have been tribal politicians, have we? I think we've done our best for the country and what we believe in. And so I think you're being a bit unfair. And I think personally, Harriet or anybody else in this room or any other candidates could perfectly well control the House and be fair and be respected on all sides. I really don't think that's a problem. Mm. I think that one, one thing we haven't mentioned are the minor parties. Because I actually think under Speaker Burko, the very small parties, the Lib Dems, for example, uh, Plaid Cymru, the DUP, have been quite often not given a fair chance. And so I think that, that if I was Speaker, I would certainly make sure that, that all of the minor parties, including independent MPs, were properly taken care of. Well, it's been quite a consensual hour. I wasn't <laughs> expecting huge controversies, but um, you've all set out your stalls. The election is taking place, assuming there isn't a general election. The election, is it November the 4th? Correct. Is, is that right? Well, we, will, we hope to hear from four of the other candidates on October the 24th. So thank you to Harriet Harman, Sir Edward Lee, Shaila Shvara and Sir Henry Bellingham. Coming up in the thank next you. hour, it's Brexit again. You're listening to LBC. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player... And Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC.